Welcome to whiskey.com, where fine spirits meet. My name is Lüning, Horst Lüning, I'm the master taste of whiskey.com. And today we have the frequently asked questions number, hmm, I don't know. There are so many FAQs already here on my channel or in my vlog uh, that I stopped counting from today. I think the last one is several weeks ago. So time for her answering three more questions. And the first one is from a experienced user which uh, likes Kevlan whiskies, the Vigno Barrique and the Solist Sherry Cask. And he has quite some experience and he finds that these whiskies, despite the relatively low age of five to six years, are extremely good and better than a lot, if not most, of the Scottish whiskies. Uh, the good quality is from, well, the distillate, the distillation process, very good casks, and the climate in Taiwan, where the Kavalan distillery is situated. And uh, why, and this is his question, uh, do not switch the Scottish distillers over to heating their warehouses to higher temperatures for, well, a few hours, then uh, the maturation process would be more like the Kavalan maturation process with the high temperatures and then the whiskey would be better. They would be able to generate high quality whiskies in a quite a short time. <laughs> uh, well, there had been some experiments in the US with, with heated warehouses, but not for a few hours, but for at least two weeks. They closed all the windows uh, and tried to, to fix every gap between the windows and the walls and a lot of wood. And uh, so it wasn't that easy to insulate uh, the warehouse. And then they heated it up for 14 days for a fortnight. And they did that, I think, twice in a winter. And the quality improved. You got another two maturation cycles in a winter. So you had three maturation cycles in a year. And these maturation cycles, well, the, the whiskey heats up, heats up and presses the air out of the cask. And then when it cools down, it tears fresh air in again, and therefore it breathes. Uh, and uh, this brings, well, the maturation. Um, but energy demand was high, was really high. And uh, today, where the interest rates are low or even negative, and the big corporations, uh, which are not well, they have a lot of money and do not need uh, credits. Uh, so there is no need to spend the money on, well, on fuel for heating up the warehouses, but they can invest it in additional whiskey, like down to rest and mature by nature. And then, uh, well, just wait a few years more. Um, what Kavalan, the problem of Kavalan is they lose, I think, uh, Benedict had been uh, in India and visited the Amrut distillery and they have uh, up to 30 degrees centigrade uh, in summer. And with this high temperature, the vapor pressure of the alcohol in the cask is really high and they lose about a third of the cask content of the whiskey in three years. So if you're doing this heating, you're losing money. You're not getting better whiskey in a shorter time. You're losing money. You, you lose money by evaporation and you lose money by buying fuel for heating it up. Uh, so there's really no way uh, to change it. And if a Scottish distiller would start with that, I'm quite sure that the Scotch Whiskey Association uh, would turn over uh, and forbid that because they uh, there had been a distillery, I think it was Loch Lomond. They produced malt whiskey on column stills and uh, 
today with the new regulations from 2009 for the Scotch whisky industry, uh, where the Scotch whisky uh, association was the the main part in the regulation. Uh, they forbid producing malt whiskey in column stills, but you have to use pot stills for the well for the tradition. And if you start heating up warehouses, where's the tradition? Mm. Yeah, so I think they will never do that. And I think we like the whiskey, the Scotch whiskey, as it is. There are other wonderful whiskies on the world, and uh, this is additional fun for us. There's no, no competition. It's fun. Yeah. The second question is, uh, how have you learned to smell all those aromas in the whiskey. I would like to be able to do as well. Well, um, we have to discuss how our taste in the human body is functioning. On your tongue, you have receptors. And in former times, you said sweet, sour, bitter, and so on. Uh, today, we know there are three dozen uh, different receptors in our tongue and they are able to well detect several aromas and uh, one is umami the the proteins the meat and for those we have a lot so we are from the past canny wars yeah and these receptors have their nerves going into our back, then our spline going up to our head. And this, uh, well, uh, transmission is, ba uh, bandwidth is quite small. So you, you can't deliver a lot of information over these nerves. So there are only very few tastes you're able to taste with your tongue. But uh, through the lower plate of your skull, uh, there are a lot of small well, gaps, holes, where nerves are going from our nose, from the receptors of our nose, to the olfactory center in our brain. And uh, there, there are uh, pattern recognition modules, uh, small columns, and they, well, they are trained with what your nose smells. And after some time, uh, those pattern recognition systems say, I had that before. Uh, if this receptor, this receptor and that and 110 over there, uh, they all combine to this pattern, then you smell whiskey. Okay. And uh, if you have a good experience, then uh, this memory is transferred into the limbic system and tells you uh, this was good. Um, but if you haven't smelled enough in your life, those pattern recognition systems aren't trained. From what? If you start eating, and there's no, no time for the uh, recognition system to be trained. So the first thing I do with every food, I smell on it. And then I start to eat. Sometimes it looks weird, uh, but uh, you learn a lot. And not only with food, start to go around in your surroundings, have some flowers, some moss, some uh, earth, uh, smell uh, at, uh, at cotton, at wet cotton, uh, at a... <laughs> an ashtray, uh, wherever, smell, have a smell, always have a smell. Um, and have a look in your kitchen. There are some spices, cinnamon, nutmeg, coriander, curry, whatever. Have fruit, smell fruit. Um, and I would suggest you you take a, a spice from your uh, kitchen to your evening place and uh, smell on it. Smell on it a week, full week. And after that full week, 
your pattern recognition system will clearly identify this smell. And it will smell variances in this smell. And the next week you take another one and smell. And with the time, your pattern recognition system in your brain is trained. And then you will smell at a whiskey and say, well, hmm, I had that 15 weeks ago. This training, this enables you uh, to smell. So on the tongue, there are, well, there you can detect smells uh, or tastes uh, by your genes. You have, everybody can do this. But the smell in the nose works with pattern recognition. So there are an awful lot of uh, sensors in your nose. And you do not only smell with a single sensor, but with a pattern of activated sensors. And that's what you have to train uh, to be able to taste your whiskey. The last question today uh, was, what are the oldest distilleries in Scotland? And uh, well, the first production of whiskey was recorded in 1494, where Friar John, who uh, forgot the name, uh, ordered a few bushels uh, for the production of Uschke Baha, which the uh, the time became whiskey. So there was a in the checker roll. I think they they wrote it down. So there is the first. Uh, Whiskey was mentioned in 1494, so in the year 1994, uh, they had a 500 year anniversary uh, for whiskey. And here I got a wonderful book. It's called The Practical Distiller. And uh, the title exactly, The Practical Distiller or a Brief Treatise of Practical Distillation. And it's from 1718. Wow, what an age! And this book was delivered uh, with a special bottle of Brugiletti in 2001, 2002, shortly after they reopened Brugiletti. And this was, well, they, they found that book and they did this facsimile print uh, and gave it to the best customers with this bottle. And it's a wonderful book. And in those times, uh, production of whiskey and the fermentation itself was kind of magic of witchcraft and with this book uh, with a time of enlightenment um, well it, it became science and this was the practical distillers and they delivered the procedures you have to follow to make good whiskey um, the first whiskey distilleries uh, had been on the run already, um, but most of them were very small in the highlands and a lot of them were illegal. Uh, they were not taxed then, uh, but I think everything they did uh, belonged to the crown. And if they produced whiskey for themselves, they stole it from the crown. I have no idea how it really was. Um, but from several places of these illegal distillations, um, real distilleries developed and the oldest one noted regularly in the media and uh, on the bottles is Glen Turret with 1775. So they are fast running to their 250th anniversary and they are, well, just north of the tax line between the lowlands and the highlands, which goes from Greenock to Dundee. Uh, probably they were illegal until 1823-24 when a king Edward the mm -hmm, mm -hmm, uh, sorry about that uh, he said well I'm the king and I like Highland malt whiskey and from the day on Highland malt whiskey is no longer illegal <laughs> I'm bored of the whiskey which was produced in the industrial centers from Glasgow to Edinburgh uh, and the good stuff is from the highlands and uh, but you have to uh, uh, ask for a license, and they were uh, given 
freely and the taxes weren't that high and uh, so all those thousand uh, illegal distilleries uh, shortly uh, reduced to several hundred or a thousand uh, legal distilleries which were bigger than and uh, then the railway was established and the whiskey was shipped to uh, the centers and, and so on. You know that story. Um, so the next one is Beaumont and I have a wonderful bottle here, a 10 year old from Oloroso Sherry Cask and Wine Cask from the Trouble Value. Um, and they are from 1779 on the Isle of Isla. And the Isle of Isla is not Great Britain. Nope, <laughs> they are United Kingdom. And, uh, well, uh, the laws from the uh, prohibition of producing whiskey in the highlands weren't uh, effective on the isle. So they're from 1779, and they claim to have their, the oldest whiskey warehouse in the world, I think, or in Scotland, no, in the world, I think. It's the vault number one, and this one lies below sea level, so normal zero um, and you, you see drops, water drops coming from the wall. So it's a damp atmosphere, a very special maturation climate in that old warehouse. Then there's Strathyla from 1786, a wonderful picturesque distillery. Um, they have a self-guided tour and uh, well it's hobbit houses uh, and two kilns and a water wheel, wonderful looking. Uh, and they are the main part in Chivas Regal. And, uh, well, I learned uh, from a Scot uh, that it's not Chivas Regal, but it's Chivas Regal. Yeah, so I change over to that uh, <laughs> until I heard here next time, the other way around. Uh, yeah. Uh, Bal Blair, 1790, in the Northern Highlands. And I visited it in 1994 or five. And they had a collection of very old bottles, I think from the late uh, 18th century or the early 1800s. Um, so there yeah, you can see they really have a heritage uh, where they're proud of. Then Oban on the West Coast, they are from 1794. And well, Oban was a harbor where the uh, ships, the immigration ships, went over to the new land, to the new world. And so there was always a, a busy community there demanding for their whiskey. Uh, so they were able to have their distillery very close to the harbor and they are still in production today. And then there's Glengarry, written Glengarry uh, from 1797. They are in the East Highlands, not too far away from Stathila. And if you have a look at those distilleries, you can see they are from all over Scotland, from the Northern Highlands to the East, to the West, to the South, even on the Isles. Uh, so there was always the possibility for a good distillery uh, to survive all the struggles they had over the centuries. And therefore, I think you should have a bottle of each of those 1800 distilleries at home in your bar. That's it for now. Thank you very much for watching. Stay tuned. There's more to come. And as always, feel free to share this video with your friends.